All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, my name is Matt O'Keefe. I'm here to talk about cloudy, open source, and DevOps. And by the way, um, there's the URL for my SlideShare account. I uploaded the slides earlier, so if you want to check that out, you know, no need to take notes or anything like that. So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm an architect at Morningstar, and Morningstar is a leading provider of independent investment research, advice, data, software. Um, I like veggie burgers too, but that's a different company. And my role at Morningstar is its really interesting because my background is in software, but I'm now an architect on the infrastructure team, which is a very small shared team. And my job is to interface with um, all of our development teams. And there's quite a few of them. It's a very distributed, um, highly decentralized type of organization. Hundreds of developers all pretty much operating independently above that layer of infrastructure. Um, I'm also active as a meetup organizer. So if you go to meetup.com and you search for one of these groups, you can find that we've been doing some, some awesome tech talks. Uh, we've had Dean speak at Morningstar Tech Talks, for example. We've got uh, Cassandra Chicago is a new group we just started. Um, and we just kicked that off with a, a guest speaker from Riptano, uh, now known as Datastax. And we have DevOps Chicago. That's one of the topics I'm going to be talking about today is DevOps. But this group has really taken off. I think we have over 200 members. And I'm helping to run those meetups along with uh, Martin Logan, which, who some of you may have seen here on Friday talking about agile development and DevOps. And I'm a contributor at DevOps.com, also working with Martin Logan on that site. Um, currently, we're doing some blogging, and we're also going to be doing some interesting projects around open source development. So I want to talk to you about cloud computing. But first, I just want to give you a little bit of something to think about in terms of motivation. So uh, you know, a fundamental concern with software architecture is scalability. And uh, a good way to define that at a high level is the ability for a system to adapt to increasing demands. And this is really important for me. Uh, at Morningstar, you know, we, the company's been growing steadily for uh, over 25 years now. And that's both through organic growth and also through acquisitions. But we keep adding more and more products, more and more developers. Um, but the infrastructure needs to be able to, to meet that demand. And one of the ways that uh, we're doing that is by investigating and adopting cloud computing. So the current situation, we have a uh, presence in 26 countries. We've got about 3,100 employees. And I'd say, you know, roughly, I'm, I'm sort of guessing, but maybe about 800 of those are developers, so quite a few. Over 7 million individual investors that we serve, uh, primarily through Morningstar.com, but also with some other products. And about 245,000 financial advisors with some uh, advisor workstation and, and back office type products. About 4,200 institutional clients, 70,000 print subscribers. So that's a, lot of, uh, that's a lot of product. We're supporting that with 18 data centers throughout the world. And these vary in size from you know, a full-blown co-location facility, very large modern infrastructure, full redundancy, and so on. Um, down to the level of uh, a server room in one of our offices. We've got about 1,100 physical servers, and we're using VMware extensively. So we virtualized quite a bit, including production. We've got about 2,700 virtual servers now, uh, about 4,100 virtual CPUs, and approaching a petabyte of raw storage. So it's a lot to manage. We've got a team of 27 systems engineers that are uh, taking care of all this infrastructure. So that's pretty good. Um, you know, but in terms of scalability, there's different ways to measure it. One way that I'd like to think about measuring it in terms of organizational scalability is the ratio of servers to engineers. So Morningstar is about 42 to 1 BC before cloud. Um, but we look at the leaders in other you know, industries as well. Amazon EC2, 266 to 1. Microsoft, 1,000 to 1. 
Google, 10,000 to 1. These numbers are just off the charts, right? But the thing that these guys have in common, you might think here is, you know, it's more than a coincidence that these three guys, uh, they essentially invented cloud computing technologies in order to deal with their own issues of scalability. So that's why, you know, we are actively moving into the cloud. Um, so many other people are. It's, you know, one of the biggest, one of the hottest areas today, right? Everybody's talking about to the cloud and everything's moving into the cloud, everything and the kitchen sink. But with all the, with all the buzz and all the hype, it's kind of hard to get a clear definition of what that means. So here's one definition. Can everybody read that in the back? Uh, so this is the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, the government arm that is dealing with, you know, defining these things and helping drive standards and so on. And, um, you know, it's funny, it's, it's hard, it doesn't really fit on one slide, but there's actually a lot of good content in here. There's still quite a bit of debate among the experts about, you know, the subtle differences, um, but you should check this out. The second draft just came out recently. I prefer a more simple dis definition, at least for this talk, you know, because this talk isn't going to be all about cloud. But the simple concepts um, are that it's a paradigm shift. It really is a fundamental change in how IT services are delivered. And I think over the next three to five years, this is just going to become more and more obvious. Um, and the features that uh, are really important are that you, know, you can del deliver services on demand in a self-service model, pay as you go, and with a seemingly infinite capacity. So it's anything as a service available to anybody with an internet connection. It's extremely powerful. Uh, a lot of you have already seen this in the startup world, right? These days, if you were to launch a startup and you went to a venture capital firm and you said, yeah, you know, we need a few million dollars to get started and we think, oh, maybe about 500, 800,000, you know, we're gonna build out our data center. They would actually just laugh you out of the room because they know that the public cloud infrastructure is available and for just pay as you go type of financing, you can get up and running and start building your product and get it in front of customers. So there are a few different types of service offerings that you'll hear about. Um, infrastructure as a service, this is the most basic layer where you're talking about servers, network and storage. And above that, you have platform as a service and that's where you have a layer of software that's also provided by the cloud. And this software could be things like middleware, it could be components that you would build upon that have APIs. Um, but it's, in some environments, it's as simple as writing your code in your IDE and cutting and pasting, you know, into the, the service provider's uh, tool that's gonna upload it to their cloud and run it on their servers. And then you have software as a service where all of the software is in the cloud. The end users just need to log in with the browser and everything's there for, for the running. And there's, uh, it's an amazing ecosystem. Um, you know, I've been looking at cloud for just over a year now, and it's amazing every day, if you pay attention to this stuff, there's a new company that's launched and they're gonna provide, you know, some, kind, some type of service to fill a niche that someone else isn't already um, doing a good job at. But, you know, if we, if we think about the previous high-level diagram and, and take a deeper dive, what we have at the bottom layer, of course, is hardware. And that's one area where, you know, we're not going to talk a whole lot about open source, but um, it can be everything from enterprise-grade HP, Cisco type of hardware kit, uh, and NetApp, SAN, EMC, and so on. Or you can talk about commodity hardware. The great thing about cloud is, in many cases, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, above that, you have the hypervisor, and the hypervisor is what provides for virtualization. What that means is, you know, you install an operating system like Zen Server or VMware ESX, if, you, if you're a VMware customer, and that provides support for running multiple virtual machines on that same physical server. So those are guest operating systems that, to the end user, essentially look like they have their own dedicated machine, but it's easier to get more utilization of the underlying hardware, plus with APIs and management tools, it's easier to be 
agile and efficient in terms of managing those things. Then above that, uh, well, you can do a lot with virtualization on its own, so don't get me wrong, but if you really want to do self-service on demand where you don't need to go to a systems engineer and provision a, a new server, uh, you need some type of infrastructure as a service software. And this is where, you know, perhaps the best known public cloud example is Amazon Web Services. And you have uh, Rackspace Cloud, that's another great example. But we're also starting to see open source software projects uh, that enable you to take the same principles of cloud computing and apply that to your, to your own private data center. So if you have issues around security or compliance, you might want to still have the flexibility and agility that pr cloud provides, but build it yourself. And one example on this slide is uh, cloud.com cloud stack. And in fact, uh, open source cloud software is being used in commercial public cloud providers as well. So if you look at Tata Communications, for example, their large service provider in India, they've recently launched uh, a public cloud provider service that's based on cloud.com cloud stack. And uh, on the top left, there's yet another layer, cloud management. And this is where I don't see a whole lot of activity uh, for an end-to-end -end solution based on open source, but there are some really interesting companies that a lot of startups are leveraging highly, such as RightScale. And this is where you, know, you can have templates and automation around provisioning an entire environment. You know, let's say you want to fix a bug in production. You could do something as radical as say, you know, provision me a whole set of virtual machines that are, you know, a copy of the production environment. I want the identical environment so when I fix that bug and test it, you know, I'm sure that it's going to work when I push that code into production. And Instratus is another great example of a, a player in this area. They, they provide a really interesting security architecture. Um, so key management and user account management and things like that, encryption of uh, volumes in a multi-tenant environment. These are some things that a company like that is hoping to address. There are some uh, interesting open source projects in this space, uh, such as uh, JClouds. Um, it's a Java-based open source project that lets you abstract the differences from the different cloud providers. Um, and there's a whole bunch of projects around cloud management in terms of uh, automating provisioning of something like a Hadoop cluster with a project called Whir. Now, if we look to the right of that, we have platform as a service. And, you know, a couple of good examples. Um, Force.com is the platform that Salesforce.com has launched where, again, you can use their database and perhaps the same data that drives your CRM application you can do that to build your own custom web application. Uh, Google App Engine is another good example. And Heroku, which was recently acquired, it's a great example if, if you're doing Ruby web apps. Uh, it makes it really simple to get something up and running. And finally, software as a service, uh, salesforce.com. And most of you are familiar with that model. So what is not cloud computing? You know, there's a lot of hype. There's this term cloud washing, which explains, you know, that really a lot of products that are labeled cloud these days, it's nothing more than just updating the marketing material for the product to make it sound cloudy. And it's something you have to look out for. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, consultancies are, are really, you know, hitching their, their cart to this cloud bandwagon because there's so much activity, it really does feel like the next big wave of computing, much like the internet was maybe in 97, um, you have to look at this stuff with a critical eye. Also, a lot of people are going to promise that cloud is going to save you lots of money. And that's not necessarily true. Uh, there's this interesting thing called Javon's paradox, which explains that the easier, the more efficiently you can obtain a resource, which you know is in high demand, uh, the higher the rate that you're going to consume it. So cloud servers might be easy to provision and they might be cheaper, but if you can build more software, launch more products, and do it all faster, then in the end you might spend the same amount of money. It's all good for the end user in terms of your customers because you're pushing more functionality, but 
It's not like you're going to drive your cost of IT down to zero. In terms of um, public cloud service providers, it does appear that you know it's very cheap to get up and running on a public cloud, but you should be careful. You know, if you're on EC2 and you reserve a large instance, which might be suitable for running an app server, for example, it's 34 cents an hour if you choose an on-demand instance. And it sounds really cheap, but you multiply that out, and you know, it's about 250 bucks a month, maybe about 3,000 a year. Um, if you're a bootstrapping startup, you know, you have to be careful. You can get in trouble here, especially if you do things like launch a server and then you go home at night and you forget that it's still running and you don't have a good cloud management tool that's going to help you keep track of what's running where. Okay, so why should you care about cloud computing again? Uh, really the main reason is that through automation you can just get really uh, a really scalable organization that can be very agile and very efficient in terms of how much manpower you need to launch products. And you know, a great example of this is uh, reddit.com. It's one of the top 100 internet sites in terms of traffic. And they have four employees. They have four computers and they're all just the employees' laptops. So everything else is, is running in the cloud and you know, they're using all sorts of automation to, uh, to manage deployments and so on. And um, you know, Google, once again, they're just a great example of how you can use these sort of technologies to get massive scale. So the, the sticker on the laptop, my other computer is a data center. That's how people are starting to think. It's like data center as a service. Thousands of computers, one engineer. In terms of economics, the, the real story in terms of benefit is elasticity. So just consuming what you need to serve the end users. So in this chart, you've got you know, one line that's sort of like the traditional capacity planning um, uh, projected demand for a product that is growing. But in reality, you know, there's always ups and downs. There's cyclical types of demand. And if you have a traditional type of uh, hardware procurement model, what you're going to do is, is spend a whole bunch of money to rack and stack hardware, and it might sit idle because the demand hasn't actually reached that level yet. Or if your product is growing faster than you anticipated, you might find yourself flat-footed and users are starting to get frustrated because you know, the site's crashing all the time or there's high latency. There's just not enough hardware to meet demand. But with the cloud and with automation that lets you spin up servers in just a few minutes time and also shut them down when the demand decreases, you can just within minutes adjust to meet the actual demand. And even if you're not using public cloud, if you're in a large enough enterprise, you can have a pool of servers that's a shared pool for all the different business units to use and you can adjust you know, allocate servers to one application versus another in uh, close to real time. So another uh, use case that's really relevant to us, um, we have a lot of customers that, uh, that purchase licensed data feeds. And a lot of times, you know, in the financial space, we're talking about um, weekend or perhaps month end. You know, the market closes and then this, the clock starts ticking because you have a contract with the customer that says you have X number of hours to deliver a, a package of, uh, of data. Now, in a traditional model, you might allocate, let's say, three servers to this project because that's what the budget calls for or you know, whatever the case may be. And so maybe data production takes you 15 hours and you've got three hours left over for QA. Well, that's fine unless there's a problem with data production. You need to rerun the process after fixing some bad data points or something of that nature, that can be a problem. So what if you could use cloud to allocate you know, 5, 10, 15 servers, whatever it takes to temporarily shrink that data production time down to, you know, let's say, three hours. In that case, you've got 15 hours left over to do testing. If, you're, you prime, if you find a problem with the data package, you could actually regenerate the whole thing and still be well, well within your SLA. Or, you know, in some cases, the value of the data is higher 
if the, if the customer can receive it earlier. So in that case, maybe your production time is three hours and you keep your, your regular QA cycle of, of three hours. So I mentioned earlier that uh, not all companies are really ready to adopt public cloud and security is usually a, the number one concern that's raised. There's also issues around compliance. So the good news is there's, there's a number of open source infrastructure as a service projects that you might be able to use on your own hardware, again, to get some of these same benefits. Um, I think Eucalyptus Systems is, is a great example. They've been around for quite a while now. And they, they became very popular because essentially what they did is they took Amazon EC2's APIs and they implemented on the back end a service that you could deploy in your data center that would implement those same APIs. So that way you can get the same skills, uh, reuse of the same skills and the same client side tools, whether you want to deploy your software on EC2 or in your own data center. There's a few other projects. Um, I'll leave it you know, on your own to, to check those out. Maybe the, the most exciting one lately is uh, OpenStack, which was just announced last year at OzCon. And I believe there were about 25 different companies that signed up in support of this open source project. Um, Rackspace is probably the, the number one uh, sponsor of the project. And um, it's, it has broad support. So it, development is, is um, you know, it's progressing very rapidly. And I believe they just recently had a uh, compute service and a storage service that is ready for you to deploy. Cloud.com though, in my book, um, probably the most mature of the bunch. They're on version 2.x, I think it's 2.3, 2.2 or 2.3. Um, but they're actually in use in production. They've been around for quite a while, so it's, it's a mature project. And uh, they're, they're also working very closely with the OpenStack project. So they're contributing to it, and they're also looking for ways to incorporate that code into their own project. So here's a look at their architecture. And um, what you can see is that, you know, we talked about servers, network, and storage. And then we talked a little bit about virtualization. And then you have service management and everything above that. That's really what the infrastructure as a service is, is providing. Everything from image libraries to resource management, um, managing perhaps multiple pools of resources. Uh, Cloud.com is interesting because they actually support multiple hypervisors. So if you're an enterprise and you're running VMware, but you want to start experimenting with Zen Server, um, you know, you can actually have two different pods or, you know, a number of pods and present those all in a uniform way within one cloud. There's also uh, things like dynamic workload management and availability and security, load balancing, backups, uh, high availability, monitoring. And all of this is presented with um, you know, user interface and a developer API. And there's also hooks into the type of management tools that your operations center is probably already using for, uh, for monitoring and for the other types of uh, IT systems. So with that, I want to do a, just a quick demo just to give you a feel for CloudStack. All right. So here we are, we're at the, uh, the management console. I'm gonna log in as an administrator. And I'm gonna log into a domain because it is a multi-tenant environment. And what I have is a console with the dashboard. It gives me a high level summary of the types of resources I'm consuming currently. So let's go ahead and take a look at instances. I choose my instances. It's going to give me a listing of the, the servers that I've deployed so far. And if I, you know, look on the right and scroll down a little bit, I can see some of the details about um, what type of guest operating system this is running, the size of the server, when it was created, um, what group it's in. Let's go ahead and launch a new server. So I'm going to hit the Add Instance button. 
The one thing you'll notice here is that um, you can choose an availability zone. So this is much like choosing a data center. So you can have a cloud that spans across more than one data center. Here we've got San Jose and Chicago. I'll just go ahead and leave it on San Jose. Then on the left, you select uh, from a group of templates. Um, there's a, a number of predefined templates that were provided to me, the featured templates. Um, I could also create my own templates. And this is helpful if you are, um, you know, if you want to pre-install some middleware or some custom software that your company uses on each server, or if you want to uh, apply some standards around security hardening, things like that, um, you can create your templates and, and add them to this system. But let's go, just go ahead and choose a CentOS no GUI Zen server. We'll go to step two. Here I choose what size instance I want in terms of how many CPUs, how much RAM. Let's pick a medium instance. And what size data disk would I like? You know, 20 gig sounds pretty good, at least for the primary disk. We'll select that. And then we're going to select um, the primary network that we're going to launch the server into. Now, they do support different models here where you can have uh, VLANs if you need isolation uh, between types of applications and so on. Or you could have a more traditional flat network. Uh, a lot of cloud providers just give you a flat network and then you overlay security groups on top of that. By default, in this test environment, we just have the um, you know, dedicated virtualized network. We'll select that and then give it a name. And I'm going to review the details. Let's go ahead and launch that. All right, so now up here in the top left, you can see the status. It's, it's telling me it's adding the server now. In a lot of cloud provider environments, it might take a few minutes um, to add a new server, but this one's pretty fast, so we can just wait. All right. So here is Web App 3. And in a moment, it gives me a thumbnail of the console. I can just click on that. And you see it's still booting up. All right, so now I've got the login prompt. So there we go. In just a few minutes, I provisioned my own CentOS box, and it's going to act pretty much just like any other virtual server um, running on my own hardware. So if we go back to the, the main console, um, one of the other things you can do is add another disk for storage. Uh, let's just go to add volume. Choose the size. Maybe I'm going to have lots of data. Let's say 100 gig. So does that UI become cumbersome when you have thousands of instances running? Yes. <laughs> Good question. Well, there's, there are ways to address that. Um, and one way is to use APIs. So not only do you have the GUI, but you also have an API that gives you the same capabilities. Another way to do it, which is what we're pref we prefer, given some complexities around you know, our environment, um, we're looking at cloud management solutions like Instratus that give you a, a higher level of abstraction. And um, they let you group servers into like templated patterns where you consider can you can consider a group of servers as an application and the web app might scale from two to ten and back but you know you don't have to think about that so much all right so we just added the data disk and i should be able to just attach that disk web app three 
This is an AJAX based interface. So again, it's just gonna spin for a moment or two and attach disk su successful. Um, one other thing to highlight, the network. I can, um, you know, everything I've done so far is on the private network, but I can uh, acquire a new public IP address. All right, and now that I own that, can select it from the list and set up port forwarding. So let's say, you know, we wanted to listen on port 80. It's going to forward to 8080 TCP, and I choose that web app server. Just a simple example, but you know, everybody gets the concepts, right? It's much like EC2, except open source, running on your own hardware. It's good stuff. Any questions before we move on? Well, um, the, the price you would pay for this, if you want to do it on your own, is just the engineering time that you would take to install it on your own hardware. So it's really no additional charge unless you do, um, they do offer commercial support if you want them to help you set it up and so on. I believe they have some, uh, some standard images, some templates that you could reuse. Um, and other companies like Rightscale also contribute templates because they work as partners with cloud.com. Um, or you could create your own. So one thing I didn't show is that uh, after I create a virtual machine, I could install the custom software that's proprietary to my business and harden it in terms of security. And then I could take that machine and snapshot it and create a template out of it so I could clone it in the future. And that's the sort of job that a systems administrator would do in advance of turning this over to a team of developers. So you have a little bit of governance over what sort of images are deployed into your cloud. All right. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, the GUI is pretty cool. It's fun to play with, but they also provide APIs. And as we turn the discussion into a talk about DevOps, you know, that DevOps is all about APIs. Automation is possible because you have APIs that you can program against. DevOps is about CAMs. So I think John Willis had uh, an excellent post that he did. He kind of laid it out. It's really a cultural movement. DevOps is not uh, some kind of methodology where you can just go buy a book. It really starts with the culture, and we're gonna talk about that real quick. So here's the fundamental problem, right? In the traditional organization, development and operations have conflicting goals. Developers are rewarded for launching products, for pushing code, and operations, they're rewarded for uptime. Well, it just so happens that a lot of times when you push code, especially if it's a big, huge release of code, it leads to some downtime. And if a company is large enough and you've got a large centralized operations team, you know, they all sit over there and developers sit, well, everywhere, right? There's often this wall that kind of divides them and communication can be an issue. There's also different sets of tools that are used. So, uh, you know, in a developer environment, he might be free to install whatever sort of package or configuration he needs to make it work for him. And then, oops, you know, I forgot when I pushed this package, I forgot to tell operations that they need to install FUBAR BAS, you know, in production. So deployments become this, this situation where the phrase is, you know, throwing stuff over the wall. And that generally leads to a bunch of train wrecks. What DevOps is about is trying to align these two groups to think at a higher level about the business. Think about the customers. The customers don't care how you deploy code, they just wanna use it, right? So DevOps in many ways is finishing what agile development started. If you think about the interface between business and dev, you know, agile got those teams sort of integrated 
and uh, communicating in a very open, transparent, iterative manner. Well, DevOps is about doing the same with development and operations. One way that you can do this is actually to change the way your organization is structured. So, you know, when I started looking at cloud, I saw all this talk about DevOps and I was like, oh yeah, cloud, this DevOps stuff is pretty cool. But then I started reading more about it, you know, dev2ops.org, for example, and I remembered, oh, you know, when I was working at Orbitz, um, I was there for about eight years, you know, watched it go from a startup to a bigger company, started seeing some of the same type of issues in the enterprise, and uh, a lot of this DevOps stuff came along, and um, it's equally applicable to the enterprise. So in fact, if you look at this exchange on Twitter, uh, Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, he pointed out, hey, you know, Riley, uh, Christian Riley, he's uh, an expert in private cloud, by the way. Um, he said, you know, Amazon.com started doing DevOps before the public cloud existed. And essentially what they did is they said, you know, we're gonna have a service-oriented architecture and we're gonna give service ownership entirely to the development teams. That means you don't just write the code and test it, you're gonna run your service as well. So you build it, you run it, that also means you carry a pager. Um, you know, a lot of people don't wanna hear this if you're a developer, but um, it's, it's good for you to experience the pain of operations by carrying a pager and seeing it go off at three in the morning and you're like, okay, um, how am I gonna fix this? You know, These are the types of cultural things that, that DevOps is, is really helping to promote, that idea of, of owning the product all the way through into operations, not just, you know, it's done when it's tested. And the corollary here, uh, my Twitter friend, DevOps Burat, you know, he said, you wanna learn DevOps, uh, first find cloud expert and DevOps expert on Twitter. Because it's really cool, you know? These guys are having these conversations out there in the open. And he also says, automate um, everything. So the, the rule of thumb about automation is basically, if you find yourself doing something manually two or more times, then automate it. So next we'll talk briefly about automation. Uh, there were actually a few different talks at the conference this weekend um, that provided a pretty good overview of the DevOps tool chain. Uh, Martin talked about it on Friday. And if you stick around in this room after my talk, uh, Garrett from Puppet Labs is gonna be doing a, a deep dive on Puppet. But um, CF Engine is a project that's been around for quite a while. It's very mature and robust. I believe that it inspired some of the work that was done on Puppet, um, which in turn inspired another project that's um, very popular these days, it's named Chef. Um, so I'm not gonna do a deep dive on this topic because there's still more to cover, but I do encourage you to go to the Google Groups uh, DevOps Toolchain group and sign up, and there's, it's very active as you can see from this little screenshot. Um, people are very helpful to answer all your questions, but in a nutshell, automation means configuration management. It should be automated in terms of having a canonical source of truth about how any environment should be configured and then being able to easily in an automated, efficient way and a safe way, make that environment true for any server that you might launch into the cloud. So it's great if you can launch a server into the cloud in just a few minutes, but it's just a server, right? You still have to install and configure the software, and then you have to actually automate the deployment as well. Continuous delivery is, uh, you know, it's, it's incredible what some companies are doing. Um, Etsy, John Ospal writes about what they're doing there. They're actually doing over 25 releases per day. It's, it's amazing. And you think, well, what's so great about that? Well, the great thing is that you're taking the same amount of code, and you know, if you might wait four or six weeks and bundle it all together, that's a huge amount of risk, because that's a large amount of change. When you push that into production all at once, something goes wrong, in a large enough system, it might be hard to know exactly which change actually caused that problem. 
but if you chunk it up into small little bytes, you know, think about continuous integration. Take that a step further and do continuous deployment. If you can automate the pushing of those small amounts of change, you know, very frequently, and if something breaks, it's easy to detect that and roll it back. So don't do it like this. Do it more like this. Try to get a feature launched to the customer as quickly as possible. You know, in this case, if one small feature in a major release is at risk, it puts the whole release at risk. This is better because you can turn around on a dime. Also, don't be a cowboy. So DevOps is not about developers getting pseudo privileges in production and just going nuts. It's, it's much more disciplined than that. It involves um, collaboration, I think, is probably the most important term. So be a loser. You know, you can be really fast. You can ship code really fast, get your work done, and get rewarded very quickly. But think about the DevOps team as the designers of this track that these guys are racing down. It's not like it's no holds barred cowboy programming. They've actually designed the track to get you down the mountain as quickly as possible, but also in a safe way. Now, measurement is extremely important because if you're doing continuous deployment, you know, you, you need to be prepared when things go wrong. So I think this is one of the most uh, popular tweets on the subject that I've seen since I started following the hashtag. But it's true, you know, it's funny because it's true. And again, using Etsy as an example, what they've done is they've, they monitor everything they're able to monitor using a whole bunch of open source tools. And uh, here's a screenshot of one of their, their key metrics that they follow, which is uh, PHP warnings. And they're using an, an open source tool that Orbit's released called Graphite. So they've got minutely updates and they're annotating this chart to show when they push the code. So if they push some bad code, let's say, you know, after four o'clock right here, um, within a minute or two, they're gonna know that something went wrong. And in this case, about 10 minutes later, they pushed another, you know, piece of code that actually fixed most of those errors. And there are a few errors remaining, but they fixed those like 10 minutes after that. Uh, there's a whole bunch of tools to look at for open source monitoring. Uh, some of these focus more on the system level in terms of uh, servers and network and storage and so on. Others are more, a bit more comprehensive like uh, Xenos. Um, Spring Source has a community version of Hyperic, which is very powerful and uh, includes some, some extra features. Uh, if you buy the enterprise version, for example, you can do things like control actions where you close the loop you could have a threshold for some type of metric where, let's say a thread count goes above a thousand in a JVM, you can automatically go out and restart that server, things like that. But one of my favorites, because I had a hand in creating it, uh, it's called Irma. And this is actually a different level of monitoring where you're actually using a Java API um, to instrument your code. So you can become you can get as granular if you, as you like in terms of measuring the performance, the availability and reliability of your apps. And this is open source on, Git, on uh, GitHub. So the, you know, one of the fundamental types is the monitor interface. And a monitor is essentially a collection of attributes. Uh, there's the event monitor is a simple way of, of using that. So in this case, you're, you know, you're, you're doing some validation of some kind of request. And if you see that uh, the request has errors, you can create an event monitor, giving it a, a meaningful name, and set some, some attributes on that, like errors, and then just fire and forget that monitor. So the great thing about Irma, the thing that makes it so reusable, is that when you're instrumenting your application, you don't have to think too hard about how that data is going to be consumed. Um, there's a flexible way to wire in different processors you might have one processor that's focused on, let's say, operational monitoring, and it's looking at low-level server-type metrics. Or you might have a business intelligence dashboard 
that's being fueled by the same data. There's also composite monitors. Um, so under the covers, there's a monitoring engine that keeps a stack of these monitors uh, for each application thread. And you can push and pop monitors on there. It'll establish parent-child relationships between these that actually let you trace the execution of a request uh, throughout your system. And it supports things like inheritable attributes. So if the request first comes in, you want to set something like a session ID that will automatically propagate to all the other monitors that are created for that same request. So here's an example of a transaction monitor. You just create it, give it a name. Um, that starts the clock ticking so you can measure latency. And then you go into try, catch, finally. Uh, if everything goes well, you call succeeded. Um, otherwise, you catch an exception, you, you can record that. In the end, you call done, and it's going to process that data and stop the stopwatch. There's some easy ways to, to reuse you know, your monitoring code. You can just apply annotations, or you can use aspect-oriented programming. Um, in this case, I'm telling the Spring Framework, any bean that you load into a context that impl implements the action interface, I want you to apply my advice to it. And it's, you know, one shot reusable way to have consistent monitoring. And you know, I talked about the parent-child relationship between monitors. You can produce these patterns across you know, four or five applications. And um, this really helps with root cause analysis because you can just focus on the origin of a problem, whether it's latency or an exception being thrown. You can write processors that can take input like this and give a high level alert to the, the, uh, the operator that says something meaningful like hotel searches are failing due to database connection pool being exhausted in application X, something like that. So I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. We just have a few minutes left. But the final piece of DevOps, which is most important, is sharing, which means closing the loop and providing feedback so that when you're doing this automation, when things go wrong, you can easily share that and recover. Um, so this is you know, a, a, a view of the solution that was developed at Orbitz. We had the applications monitored using Irma. That data was going into an event processing engine, which at the time was a commercial product. Uh, it was aggregating the events and applying functions to them, and then forwarding alarms to the operations center, forwarding aggregate data to Graphite, I think I'm going to have to skip the graphite demo, unfortunately. Um, maybe we'll do a screencast. So one of the things that's missing um, was that Streambase uh, was the event processing engine that was in use. That was a commercial product, so it kind of left a gap. Um, graphite has really taken off. So this is an example of Google's AdMob team. Um, they created this open source project called Rocksteady, and they're using Graphite. I mentioned Etsy's using Graphite. Actually, there's a ton of companies that are using Graphite now. It's been a big success. But Irma has been a, a little bit more you know, off to the side, not quite as active, and I'm convinced that a big reason for that is because we haven't had that event processing engine in the middle that would give us the end-to-end -end open source solution. So one of the things that um, I'm looking forward to working on is taking Rocksteady and creating a, an adapter for Irma to start feeding events into this system. And then we'll have you know, a lot of the you know, awesome powers of uh, measurement and sharing that, um, that can really help in terms of DevOps. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Thanks for your time. And uh, be sure to check out DevOps.com. I think I, I will definitely make a note to do a Graphite screencast. Um, in fact, we're probably going to have a tech talk coming up by the creator of Graphite in the next uh, few weeks or so. So check out the meetup group and any questions? Um, in your experience, how do you move this into the corporate uh, culture? Uh, you know, you say well, technology is there. The biggest problem, I would think, is the corporate culture of the other tech. Uh, you know, how do you move the big that? That's a good question. So 
In a traditional environment where you have a large centralized operations team, it's going to be very difficult. You're going to need support at the CXO level. Uh, one way to, get to do that is to, you know, carefully explain some of the challenges you're currently facing in terms of ever expanding release schedules and talk about that business agility uh, holy grail where you can just, you know, think of an idea and push the code into production maybe within a matter of hours using automation. Uh, the operations team is not going to like that. In a traditional environment, they're going to say, whoa, whoa, you know, we, we're not ready for that. Um, but one of the things I like about Morningstar is that it's a very decentralized organization and they're already doing DevOps in, in many ways. Uh, the infrastructure team is just handling servers, network, and storage, some other things like backups and 24-7 monitoring. But the development teams have people who are dedicated to the role of release management and, and the first layer of support. So they've taken the responsibility. They're free to do pretty much whatever they choose uh, within reason, right? We, we always... Uh, have the security officer reviewing everything when it comes to security and compliance concerns. But in terms of how they build and operate their product, it's up to them and it's been very successful. So, you know, if I were starting a company today, uh, just like Amazon, you know, that's the road that I would go down. Anybody else? Right, privacy in the cloud. Um, as I mentioned, I think security and privacy and compliance are really the, the top concerns with public cloud. But pretty much most everything I showed you today, you can do in your own private cloud using open source. And it doesn't have to be multi-tenant, so you're not worried about somebody accidentally accessing your data. You can still have the same security controls that you have currently you just have you know, one or two extra layers of software above what you already have that supports this type of automation. Um, well, one pitch before I move on. One thing I would say is that you know, people are working feverishly on this. It's not like they're just you know, blowing that off. There are different types of audits. And there's, uh, for example, the Cloud Security Alliance is doing some, some really great things to try to define the standards, uh, the way that a service provider can document their system to give you that comfort level where if you have a customer and they want to see an audit, a security audit of your application, perhaps the service provider will be prepared to actually in, in tandem with you answer all those questions in, in a way that can be actually verified. If you have monolithic deployments, these huge major releases, I've heard of, uh, you know, in the worst case, 
I've heard of companies where the business actually forecasts a decline in revenue after a major release because they know there's going to be all sorts of critical errors that are impacting revenue. So that's part of the economic argument. And then the other argument is that a new feature or a new product, the sooner you launch it, the sooner it starts generating revenue. So if you can take that perhaps a six week release schedule and say, well, on average, we can release something three weeks earlier. We'll take that revenue times three weeks times the number of products and maybe you could come up with a, a model that way. All right, well, thanks everybody. Thank you, Matt, for a great talk. Um